it. Well, good evening and welcome on behalf of Oxford Mothers Union to this ancient church. It's lovely to have you here and I welcome you too on behalf of the church wardens and the clergy team. A couple of housekeeping notices first of all. Fire exits. On the middle aisle, the door you came in through or in through the vestry, up the stairs and outside or straight down the back. I'm not expecting the fire alarm to go but if it does, it's for real. Please make your way outside as quickly as, and quietly as possible. Your mobile phones, I trust, are all turned to silent, at least. <laughs> okay. And then finally, uh, so toilet facilities, regrettably, are not in the church, yet. will be remedied very shortly. And there will be a retiring collection for the Spar Daniel Fa Spargo Mabs Foundation. There's a brass plate over by the publicity desk. Please use that for your do donations towards this wonderful work. Fiona Spargo Mabs, we're delighted to have you with Thank us. You. Um, she's going to be talking to us about making safer choices, a drugs awareness programme. And it's running in schools as well, which is great. We're, going, we're in for a wonderful interactive evening. There'll be, a, there'll be video, there'll be discussion groups. I'm sure we are in for a wonderful treat on this important subject. The only way those of us who are not of the present generation are going to know about the temptations that our youngsters undergo is to be educated about it and to help them make safer choices. So, Fiona, without more ado. So, as, as Francis has said, the Daniel Spargo Mabs Foundation is a drug and alcohol education charity that I founded four years ago, just over four years ago, with my husband Tim when our son Dan died when he was 16. And when that happened, we just wanted to do whatever we could to make sure that that didn't happen to anybody else, that no harm happened to anybody else. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do this evening is tell you a bit about, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, I'm going to tell you about Dan, and I'm going to tell you about the charity and what we're doing, but most of the evening is going to be what I hope will be useful for you um, in terms of what, what, what the risks are to young people from drugs and alcohol and what they can do to keep themselves safe. And it's all about, our charity is all about, about choices because it's about the choices that, that will come their way. By the time they get to the end of school, they're not going to have been, in, in, they're not going to have been able to avoid being in situations where they have to make a decision about alcohol, of course, we all know that, um, but drugs as well. And what we want to do, the, the reason for the charity existing really is just to make sure that, that the young people that we can reach are as well equipped as they can be to come at those choices and to come out the other side safely. That's kind of the grand master plan in, in everything that we do, is that everybody else's kids get to go home in one piece. But it is all about choices. It's about their choices, and in that each individual situation, they have to be equipped for that choice. So, this is what we're going to be doing. Finding out a little bit more about levels of exposure. What's out there? Um, and where are they coming across it? And how much? Um, What's useful to know about the risks, hopefully, and factors that are affecting decision-making. So what's going on in that adolescent brain? And what, what are the different dynamics that are going on when you're making choices? Because that's a really important element of, of anything around the risks that young people come across. Um, and what, what you can do as parents to, to help your children stay safe. And you've got lots of children here as well, which is fantastic. So hopefully, hopefully they can give you some inside tips and clues and things as well as what will be useful. So starting with the reason for the Daniel Spargo Mass Foundation, which is my son, Dan. And um, Dan is, was our, our younger son. We had two boys, Jacob and Daniel, and we just live in Croydon, so not very far from here at all. And Dan was... Um, just the very, very last person that anyone would think would come to harm from drugs. He was, 
funny and kind and really popular. Everybody liked Dan. He was prom king at the end of year 11, which is basically a popularity test. Apparently, all the girls had a crush on Dan at one point or other. He was like those boys in the teen movies that, that, that everybody has a crush on. He'd got a lovely girlfriend, Jenna. He'd been going out for more than two years. He was really bright, really interested in it, never stopped talking, was endlessly chatty, always wanted to know what you thought about stuff. Um, He'd, he was in, he'd gone into sixth form, so um, it was January 2014. He'd gone into year 12, doing really, really well. Best ever parents evening in the November of year 12. Um, he was um, in the school show. He'd just signed up as a bone marrow donor, completely off his own bat. Um, he was doing really well and in a really good place, working really hard, throwing himself into everything. Um, on um, In... They'd just been back a couple of weeks into that second term, um, and he asked if it was okay to go to a party. So having asked the usual kind of questions around that, I said that it was okay to go, but I had an uncomfortable feeling about it, unfortunately not quite uncomfortable enough, um, because it turned out that it, was, it wasn't a party, it was an illegal rave. Um, it wasn't where he said it was going to be, which was fairly local, or with the people that he said would be there. Um, it was a bunch of boys, mostly from another school, um, it was a boy who joined the school for sixth form. You know, you go to sixth form, a lot of shifting around. Some of Dan's friends had left and new people had joined. And um, th th they'd got this plan to go to this rave in Hillingdon. I didn't even know where Hillingdon was. But if you don't know either, then I feel less ignorant. But it's right round by Heathrow Airport, miles away. So from Croydon, long, 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 long way away. And there was a plan that some of them were going to take MDMA, which I had never heard of. But, and if you haven't either, uh, then again, I will feel less ignorant. Um, but it's the chemical that's in ecstasy. Um, but tends, it comes as a little bag of white powder. And unfortunately, Dan said that he would be in. And um, so one of the boys called his dealer, arranged five lots to, of, of, of MGMA to get dropped off. And these boys all dissolved it in water then. So Dan's friend Jack told me all of this story. And he said they all dissolved it in water. Jack didn't take anything, so he's like my only source of information. I've got this great big long story that has got the most important story in the entire universe, and it's just full of these massive, massive gaps, which I'll never be able to fill. Um, but Jack said that Dan was just watching the other boys all the way there, and I'm sure that he was mucking about and doing all sorts of silly nonsense, and I'm sure nobody else noticed, but Jack knew Dan really well. He could see that he was a bit kind of hesitant, a bit kind of reluctant, not really sure about it. Jack kind of wanted to say, look, Dan, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Um, but he thought if he says that, he's going to draw attention to it, maybe make it harder to kind of sneak it away, so he didn't say anything. Um, and the other boys were fine. And ecstasy is called ecstasy because it can make you feel ecstatically happy and you love everybody and all the colours are bright and amazing. And, and, and it's a stimulant, so it gives you all this buzz and energy and everything. So when they got there, Dan drank all of his. And unfortunately, what none of them could possibly have known um, was that the little bag that Dan had was... Uh, had um, was 12 times stronger than had killed people in the past. And, and he was fine for a little while, and then he collapsed, and uh, someone called an ambulance, and he was rushed off to intensive care, well, rushed off to hospital very soon in intensive care. We had the police knocking at our door and rushed over there. And they kept him going for a couple of days. They had to move him to King's. He had to have emergency surgery. He was on so many different things. But he, he died, unfortunately, on Monday, the 20th of January, from multiple organ failure. And when that happened, um, we just thought all sorts of things, one of which was, if this could happen to somebody like Dan, then it could happen to anybody. Of course we knew stuff was out there. You know, we, we weren't... We, I know so much more now than I did, which is partly why it's so great that I can be here, because I can tell you all the stuff that I wish I'd known. Um, but I wasn't ignorant at all, but I wish I'd known more. I really, really wish I'd known more about what the world is like for young people now. We'd, we'd had conversations about drugs. Tim and I had even done a course, How to Drug Proof Your Kids, a six-week course. They did say on that, you can't actually do this. Um, in, within our extended family, there's somebody who struggled with addiction to everything under the sun for years and years. We had her little boy living with us for five years. He's very close to Dan in age. So Dan had seen what damage drugs can do, and he had always been really, really anti, anti stuff. Um, but things can change in little, little bits around you and you can end up getting caught up in something that can seem normal but wasn't normal ever before. So one of the things that we're going to look at is, is that, the way that things can change. 
the way that it's very easy to make decisions that you might not otherwise have made. But the important thing is to make sure that there is uh, that 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 your children have the information that they need to make sure that they keep themselves safe. So we're looking at the risks of illegal drugs specifically as well. So that's Dan, and this is what we've done in response, trying to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else, which was setting up the, the charity. Um, we realised that we realised that young people are exposed to to drugs now in a way that they certainly weren't when I was their age, um, and I just didn't realise the level of that. Um, I also didn't realise how much schools struggle to do good drug education. Um, for, for lots of very good reasons, not because they don't think it's important, but just there's so much pressure on them to get results up in English and maths and science and all sorts of other things, and new GCSEs coming in. There's no money for anything. Teachers are under huge pressure, um, and there hasn't been the specialist resource and support resources and support out there. So young pe people are being faced with choices about things without knowing enough without being properly educated about things. So we started the charity and we do all of these things now. We, we do assemblies, uh, interactive workshops, we've got planning and resources for schools to deliver drug education within Pierce HE. We've got a youth ambassadors program and I haven't introduced my little team actually, although you would have met Olivia on the way in. Where is she? Olivia. So Olivia's going to be speaking to you later. Olivia's one of our youth ambassadors. We've got Julie somewhere here as well. There's Julie. Um, and uh, I've also got Calliope who's there, um, who is doing some research. So the University of Middlesex is doing an academic, um, some, some, uh, academic evaluation of our drug and alcohol education program because we just want to know that it's as good as it possibly can be. And Calliope is specifically researching work with parents, so I'm going to say a little bit more at the end. If anyone's got time to stay and have a chat with her, that would be brilliant. And of course, we do workshop for, for parents and training for staff as well. And, and it has just grown and grown and grown over the time that we, this is our third year in schools this year, and literally every week, today was another one, yesterday there were two, every, every week we're getting more messages from schools, and it's now 160, probably more like 170 now, which is brilliant. We also um, commissioned a, a play, Dan loved drama, he was really good at drama. Drama is such a powerful way of communicating to young people, and Dan's drama teacher was one of our first trustees and suggested we we approach Mark Wheeler, who's a playwright. She's taught for years and years and years, who's amazing, and writes verbatim plays. So all the words in the play are the words of the people in the story. Um, and amazingly, that was published by Bloomsbury in February um, last year. So that's being studied and taught and performed in schools all over the country and actually overseas as well. And we, we also then commissioned Mark to adapt it to tour. And we've just finished a second a professional tour of schools, so last spring term, this spring term, and that's been performed to, again, about another 10,000 young people who have seen that play and seen Dan's story. Um, and amazing, it's going to the Edinburgh Fringe, actually, in, in the summer, which is incredible. Theatre Company in Bradford, all these random things that happen. But that's the foundation, that's, that's what we do and why we do it. Now on to why I'm here, really, which is all about young people and drugs. So... This is why it's really good that people that look after and care about young people are here, especially if you're a parent. This is where young people go for information. About alcohol, 77% of young people, when asked in the most recent school survey that the government commissions, which I just forgot to introduce properly, but I'm going to come back to this data every now and then. So every two years, the school commissions a survey uh, this, the government commissions a survey of schools. So it's a huge national survey, um, and they ask 11 to 15-year-olds lots of different questions about smoking, drinking, and drugs. Um, and one of the things they asked them was, where would you go for useful information about alcohol, and where would you go for useful information about drugs? 77% said they'd go to their parents, then to their teachers, and then to the TV and internet. And for drugs, again, parents first, 69% and then their teachers, and then other sources. So parents are so important, such an important part, as, as it's easy to um, be, get messages from, from, from society or wherever, or even from your children, that actually you don't know anything, and they don't listen to you anymore, they only listen to their friends. But I think in terms of useful information, if the question had been, who would you talk to about drugs, it might be their mates. But if you want useful information, actually you are the place they go to, you are still the most important influence on their lives. So it's so fantastic that you're here. 
And I also forgot to say at the beginning, but I will say now, there are going to be various points, and, and one's coming up in a minute, where I'm going to ask you to talk to the people around you. You don't have to. You can ignore them if you like. But there are various kind of bits where I'm going to ask you to kind of have a little chat. But, and I have also planned in some time at the end for questions, but I will almost certainly talk too much and run out of time for questions. So please, 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 if you have anything that you want to ask, just ask. You can put your hand up, we can shout it out, whatever you like. But please do ask as you go along, because things will pop in your head, um, or say things, or whatever. Okay, so starting with a definition, because I am at heart still an English teacher, and I do like a definition, but I think we talk about drugs, and it's really important to remember what, what we mean by them, because it's important in terms of understanding what they do, and then understanding what some of the risks can be. Um, basically, they're just any substance that does something to alter those, those natural um, processes that are going on in our brains all the time. Um, so they might block them, they might mimic them, they might replace them in some way or other. But all of that can affect the way that we feel physically and emotionally and the way that we perceive things, the way that our thought processes work. And all of that can obviously affect the way that we behave and the things that we do. Right, now it's over to you. One of the things I do when I'm speaking in schools um, is to... Is, um, especially with the older ones, especially when I've got a sixth form group. Have I got something else switched on there? Yeah. Thank you. So I want to know what they know, and I want to know what's round and about there for them. So with the little ones, like today, I was talking to some year seven, so I just said, what drugs do you know? And so they've got meth and heroin and cocaine and all sorts of things. But particularly for the sixth form um, and, and the older ones, year 10, 11s, I want to know what is around and about for them because when they're thinking about choice and risk, they need to know about the things that are relevant and they need to know that, about the things that are, that are part of their, their world that they're likely to come across. Um, so your challenge for the next two minutes is what do you think is on the list of the average sixth former in London? If you've got kids with you, you can, you can, you just stay quiet. Don't tell them, otherwise you're giving them an unfair advantage. No, you can, you can talk to them. Um, what do you think is there for them? Okay, two minutes. Sorry, I'll if try you, and talk louder. If you speak louder, I can turn it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Is that better? Thank you. Okay, so, sorry, I just get lazy when I've got a microphone. I don't bother talking loudly. What do you think is there? What kind of things do you think might be on people's lists? NOS, nitrous oxide. Okay, they, these. It's got it. Yeah. Yeah. Does everyone know what they are? Right, yeah. Often found in car parks and places where the, it's possible to gather relatively secretly or whatever. But it's just, it's nitrous oxide. So it's what, if you had babies, 
which presumably the mums here did at some point. But if you had gas and air, that's what that is. It's, it's, it's a little bit of anaesthetic. And kids put it into a balloon. You get a thing to adapt it. You put it in a balloon, and then you can just <laughs> inhale it. So it's just like about 10 seconds of blocking the oxygen to your brain per canister. What else do you think is out there? Ketamine, Ketamine yes which sometimes referred to as horse tranquilizer because it is a really strong anesthetic that's used by vets, but also in human medicine. What else do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Weed, cannabis is the most widely misused illegal drug the world over by young people and adults. LSD, yeah. Actually, the hallucinogenics, particularly acid and um, magic mushrooms as well, a, a really kind of revival in popularity amongst young people. In fact, do you know, I just saw a video this morning. There's a chan channel called Ikea, which is people filming themselves, putting together Ikea furniture, having taken LSD. <laughs> Don't look it up, children. <laughs> glue. Yeah, the solvents. And it's easy to forget about the... Is that what you said? Sorry, glue. Yeah, yeah. So anything that you've got around the house that says only use in a well-ventilated space, but all of those things. It's when I was younger, that was one of the things. You know, the brown paper bag and the red all around the drippy nose and everything. And then they changed the law and you couldn't sell solvents to under 18, so it's harder to get hold of. But those are the, that for younger kids, that, those are easier things to get hold of. Incredibly risky. Not all of them, but some of them can be. And it's that kind of unpredictability and not knowing what you're doing. Spice, yet yeah, not so much for young people, but it is something that young people have heard of because that mostly it's not something that young people are messing about with anymore. It's one of the, has, have other people heard of spice? Because it's something that's in the news a fair bit. They talk about zombie drug. It's a big problem with homeless communities and in prisons. Um, it's, it's synthetic cannabis. So it's basically, the, there are two chemicals in cannabis, which are both very long names, but one's shortened to THC and one to CBD. So CBD what, is what is mainly used in medicinal cannabis. THC is what gives you the high, has a psychoactive effect. And this is manufactured THC, which is sprayed onto any plant material and then it's made into pretend cannabis. So before the law changed um, in May uh, 2016, the new Psychoactive Substances Act, you could buy these things on, in head shops on high streets, in chip shops and um, tattoo shops and markets and all over the place. Um, now it's, it's illegal. It's mainly it being used by much more vulnerable communities. It's cheaper than... Um, anything else, do you think? Tobacco, absolutely, yeah. And, and vaping, actually, is now more popular than, than smoking. In fact, the school I was in this morning, the head teacher was telling me about all the shisha pens that he just confiscated from some of their, their um, younger students. But most, most, uh, it's a very new thing, so there's not much research on the, the risks of vaping, particularly when it's used not... I think, generally speaking, it's, it's good as a stopping smoking thing. It's not so good for young people. Um, but it's kind of... There's a lot of stuff about promoting it as a kind of positive lifestyle choice, and there's kind of a bit of a hipster kind of image to it, and, and, and it smells like strawberries or whatever. Um, but most does have some amount of nicotine in as well. All of these things, really. Alcohol as well really easy to forget. A lot of young people are surprised that alcohol is a drug, but it, it, that's what it does. It, it, it changes your brain chemistry. It's one of the five most addictive substances, actually, alcohol. And as, as you will probably know, uh, you can develop a tolerance to it really, really quickly. Nitrous oxide, um, cannabis, and I'll, we'll t say a little bit about cannabis later, actually, specifically. MDMA and ecstasy uh, used to be much more rave, dance, festival sort of culture, but it's become much more mainstream more recently. And cocaine as well. Again, it's much more mainstream, especially by older teens. Much cheaper um, than it used to be kind of rich kids thing, but it's really not so much anymore. Ketamine is very popular. Um, the acid and things. Lean. Has anyone come across lean? It's, it's more something that kids talk about than they really, really use, because you can't... It's something that um, is in a lot of... Uh, music, kind of rap and grime and that sort of thing. Um, and, and in the videos, they'll see it's a drink. It's basically codeine and Sprite, and then they put sweets in it to make it a different colour. So I was talking to a, re uh, a, a local substance misuse treatment, young people substance misuse treatment manager recently, and she was saying, they were talking about lean, and they put this stuff together with cough mixture and um, 
Sprite, and then they put Skittles in it to make it change colour. So I don't think it does them an awful lot of harm. In America, which is where it's really much more of a thing, you can get codeine over the counter much more easily than you can here. Here it tends to have other things mixed in with it. Um, but it's a thing because it's in, in uh, music culture, as is Xanax as well. Um, and I have got a slide specifically about Xanax <laughs> because, again, that's something that's been... Have other people... Have you heard of Xanax? Because it's something that's been in the news lately. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. Steroids again as well. That's particularly concern for um, 16 to 25-year-olds. Use has really, really shot up. And it's particularly for... Um, and it's, it's, it's more now for aesthetic reasons than for actually kind of exercise and building muscles. Well, building muscles for aesthetic reasons rather than for fitness reasons. You know, um, have you heard of needle exchanges where you can, you know, have drop dirty needles and get clean ones? That, that used to be mostly for heroin. Now it's mostly for steroid, steroid use. And um, magic mushrooms as well are popular, even though they look disgusting. And you probably couldn't get them to eat real mushrooms. But. Okay, Olivia. There's a microphone somewhere. I have a loud voice. Oh. Okay. I have a loud so you've got loud enough voice. Okay. So, do you want to give us a little bit of insight into? So, Olivia was at a girls' Catholic school and is now at Dan's old school, which is a Church of England um, secondary school yes. for sixth form. So, what is round and about? Um, what, where, when? So, when did alcohol first appear at parties, for example? So, I would say uh, people start going to more parties around GCSE time. So any time between like 14, it's kind of when you start, I would, in my opinion. Um, and it kind of builds more and more and more. So when you're younger, people are kind of scared, like, oh, is there going to be alcohol? Like, oh my gosh. Um, and it's kind of an exciting new thing. But as you grow up, it becomes more normalized. So some people will base if they're going to go to a party, if there's going to be alcohol there. So, like, I know someone who didn't go to a party simply because they couldn't guarantee alcohol because they didn't know anyone who could buy it for them and they couldn't convince, like, their corner shop man to just serve them. Take their fake ID. Yes. Not even fake ID. They um, just to give it to them anyway. Lots of people just walk into their... Like corner shop, you know the ones that kind of. There's always a, a dodgy, dodgy corner shop everywhere. A bit dodgy, like has the Lycra mobile on top of it. Mm. It's like, you walk in there, you're like, can I, can I have vodka, please? And they're like, are oh, you 18? Of course I am. And, and they just some of them serve, um, which is very dodgy. So, um, what are the main alcoholic drinks of choice? Oh, people like to get strong things, but so like one bottle of something strong. Because if you have lots of bottles of weak things, although you'll have more to drink, there's more danger of getting caught by your parents because, or someone okay. around. So it'll be things like vodka, Bacardi, rum, so like Jack Daniels, yeah. and things like that. And what about weed? When did that start? Cannabis, when did that first appear? Um, for me, it was year seven because someone I knew from my class, my form, her, I think it was either her, her brother or her cousin was a dealer, so was growing weed as well, and like giving out to people, and they were talking about smoking it after school, but it became very, very prominent around GCSEs because you get a year 11, sort of, yeah. So people yeah. take it for stress, or? All Stress. sorts of reasons. Oh, we'll come back to reasons yeah. for things later. So what other things, sixth form, surround and about? Sixth form, I think major things are like cigarettes, weed, alcohol, and like outside. LSD, okay. um, ketamine, which is, it's not extremely popular, like not as popular as weed, but you definitely will see it about and you will hear people talking about it and people go oh have you tried ketamine and like if you meet someone new at a party they'll go what drugs have you done seriously like, that's what they'll say yeah they'll be like what oh what have you done, done? you won't okay. i haven't done anything i'm a good catholic girl <laughs> <laughs> you know? like no i haven't done anything but um like yeah you 
get judged on like what you've taken. Okay. Some. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. We'll have another moment later. <laughs> okay. So. One of the things that's useful for, for young people to know about drugs and for parents as well, and you, I mean, you will know, please forgive me for anybody that I'm patronising at any point if I'm telling you stuff that you know already. Just forgive me for a moment, and hopefully there'll be some things that are useful. But it's just useful to, to be aware, for young people to be aware that, about the effects that different drugs have. And all dif different drugs have different effects, and the randomness of illegal drugs means that that a single substance can have various different effects depending on how strong it is and what it's, if it's interacting with other things. But basically falling into different categories. So you've got stimulants that basically speed everything up like cocaine and MDMA, um, and methamphetamine and steroids. Sedatives or depressants or downers that slow everything down like alcohol and, and cannabis, um, heroin, hallucinogens. Um, and then this new category of dissociatives. So those three have been well-known and familiar, but this, this new category of dissociatives has been introduced really for these substances that are being used recreationally that are really anesthetics, which is your ketamine and your nitrous oxide. So both of those can have that kind of out-of-body dissociated effect, which and, and partly why, at least why people might take them. In terms of the risks, it's really one of the things that we always kind of start off with uh, when we're talking to young people is it's really important to remember that it's not that there are safe drugs and risky drugs, that all drugs have risk. Prescription drugs have risks. It's just that those risks are managed for us. That's why it's so hard to get a new medicine approved because those risks have got to be checked. And the more risky something is, the, the more carefully those risks are managed. And with illegal drugs, you've got all of those risks. You can overdose. There can be side effects. It might interact with other substances like alcohol really badly. Um, it doesn't just affect one part of you, it'll affect another part as well. Um, so all of those things are really important to keep in mind, but of course with illegal drugs, you've got this, this totally random, unknown quantity because of the way that they're made and supplied through a, a totally criminal process. One of the things that we've been doing, that Tim, my husband and I have been doing since Dan died, is speaking in prisons on a victim awareness course. There's this really good course that's run by the chaplaincy usually, um, uh, called Sycamore Tree Course, and it's about it's a restorative justice course. Really, it's all, and most most of the time people go on it because it's on their sentence plan, really, rather than they've seen the light and want to change their ways or anything. But it's incredibly an incredibly powerful course. And one of the reasons that we got involved in it was because people that are in prison for supply think theirs is a victimless crime. It's just no sense of responsibility or accountability or any, any sense of connection. Um, and of course, with illegal drugs, there's this whole process, this kind of, this whole randomness. It passes through so many pairs of hands, and it's all about making money. So every time it passes through another pair of hands, someone will want to make a profit from it in some way or other. And by the time it gets to the end of it, you've got a completely unknown quantity. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video. It comes with a bit of a health warning. I have got approval from Francis to show it in church because it has got some swearing in it. So if you have small children, you might want to block their ears for a little while. It's nothing worse than they'd hear on the bus. But it's just shows it's from a Vice documentary, which is something else I've discovered since Dan died. Really, really good stuff on drugs. But I've just heard, heard Vice. If, has anyone come across Vice? It's part of the HBO network. But they do, um, I've do, recently heard it, it was last week I read something that someone described it as good advice for bad kids, which I thought was, was pretty spot on, really, although not entirely fair. Um, but it, this just shows a couple of lads in a bedroom in Brighton making ecstasy tablets. We found two young entrepreneurs in Brighton who had no trouble using the dark web to sidestep Dutch competition and in the true spirit of Brexit, bring pill production to the UK. We're in the house now where the pill press is, but we don't want to be too loud because the parents are downstairs. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Yeah, all right. You look sick. Well, turn your phone on silent because it's fucking identical by a fireball ringtone. I just put it on. I know, I can't because these fucking gloves, bro. You're using your tongue on the touch screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've literally never seen anyone use an iPhone with their tongue as a finger. How does it taste? Right, I'm doing it. So how'd you get this machine? Just, uh, kind of got information I got from the dark web to buy it. So you frauded it, basically? Yeah. 
I'm not going to tell you where for. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. How do you think the dark web has changed the drug industry in the UK? Crazy. You can now purchase drugs like you can purchase a fucking microwave. But it's not coming through international gangs and syndicates through Holland. No, we're basically their competition. So what are the things that go into a pill? MDMA, yeah. microcrystalline cellulose. I use like a, whoa, shit. I use a premium mix. All right, well, can you show me how it works? Yeah, man. So that, uh, yeah, this is fucked, you know what I mean? So it doesn't come out of a fucking laboratory. <laughs> People think it's clean and shit. And how much are you making in a batch usually? I know I stayed up when uh, I did 1,600 in that like, before Glastonbury. You about 5,000. When? Oh yeah, 5,000 over... A week. A week it took. What is this to? Right, so now we've got 11 grams in here in total, yeah? 3 grams of aluminium and then fucking 8 grams of the binding agent, yeah? So just add a little bit of colour to that. Right, so we get this, we stick this in here. Whoa, we try, generally try not to spill any. We just crank them out, like. It's set all nice, isn't it? You've got red McDonald's, so the, the stamp is a McDonald's. There you go. Oh, yeah. McDonald's. That's pretty much it. And you go until you're done. Is it a little bit like, uh, the craft beer revolution where everyone wants like homemade small scale just like that yeah people are getting more of what they want i suppose and i can put other things in them do you know what i mean if someone wants me to put ketamine in it or fucking cocaine i can print xanax i can print valium i can print absolutely anything i wanted if something comes from holland we can copy that I mean, it's things like pma um and other like additives that they definitely put in their speed and stuff as well If anybody, to be honest, if you got a little pink pill like that, you would assume that it had been made somewhere safe and clean like a paracetamol or anything else. But what were some of the risks, having seen how that was made, obviously it's a small scale operation, it's a couple of lads in a bedroom, but that is so typical of the way that illegal drugs are made. No, it's genuine. I know Vice get into some really dodgy situations, a bit like Newsbeat as well, they get into some, and Stacey Dooley, but absolutely that is totally genuine. So what might some of the risks be to somebody that had one of those pills? And ecstasy pills are very often bright colours, they're logos that are specifically designed to be appealing to young people. It's not terribly hygienic, was it? No. And I hate to think if you decided to scr scrape some off the floor and put it back in to save a bit of money, what else might be in there? Absolutely. And also, if you think you're getting ecstasy and you actually you're getting ecstasy and ketamine, which have got very different effects, you've got a stimulant and a dissociative, or you're getting something like Xanax, which again, is that's a really strong anti-anxiety medication. You're, you've got things that are interacting in a completely unknown way and something you're not expecting at all. And you wouldn't know that that was there. And no, he's not a pharmacist. I don't even know if he'd have GCSE science, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> or maths. <laughs> for that matter, because it's the whole thing is 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 completely random. In terms, you say I've got eight milligrams of this and a bit of the binding agent. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And then he doesn't know what he's got. You know, he's got his he's got his um, ingredients from an illegal source. He's got a big bag of stuff he's calling premium mix. Has he has he tested that to make sure it really is premium mix of whatever it's supposed to be? You know, it could, that could be anything. It's, 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 it really is an unknown quantity. And, and the other thing that's really important with, I mean, the important thing with any drugs is what's in it and how much is in it. So particularly actually at the moment with MDMA and with cocaine and also with heroin, um, although that's not thankfully so much of an issue for most young people, for many young people, but with, with MDMA and cocaine, which are more, um, Adulterants are always a concern, so other things getting mixed in, but actually the big risk with 
with ecstasy and, and cocaine at the moment is, is strength and purity. Some really, really strong stuff on the market. And again, not consistently. If it was consistently strong, then you'd know how to handle that. But you can have pills that, are, that have got huge amounts of MDMA in and, and ones that have got hardly any. Both of which can be risky. You get one that's got hardly any, you have another one. And then, and then you might get something that's incredibly strong. But the way that he's mixing those pills with his bit of folded up chicken nugget carton, he's, he's not mixing it carefully and evenly. The amount of MDMA in each of those pills is going to be different. And again, really unpredictable. You might have, did anyone hear about, um, it was in the news this last summer and the summer before about drug testing at festivals. It came up again a bit more recently because they're talking about doing it in clubs. So it's, it was controversial because obviously is it condoning drug use? Um, but there were some festivals, two festivals two summers ago, um, Kendall Calling and Secret Garden Party, where they had for the first time ever in the UK a drug testing service because the only way that you can know with illegal drugs exactly what's in it is if you can get it properly tested. Um, and because young people come to harm every summer at festivals from drugs, um, the festival organisers manage to get permission from the police because however hard you try and what, however strong a zero tolerance policy you've got, it is just impossible to keep drugs out of festivals. And drug use at festivals is significantly higher than anywhere else in, at any other time of year. Um, it's just got that association. Thousands of people are sleeping in tents. You just can't keep the stuff out realistically. So, th so they took this pragmatic approach, got permission from the police and had a drug testing service there. So people could take a small amount of any drugs that they'd managed to sneak in and were intending to take and get them tested. Um, and they would they test them, they'd have to destroy that sample, so they're not giving them back. Uh, but they would then give them back with the results and then they'd give them a harm reduction package around that. Because so, you need to know what to do with that information as well. If you've got this, then what does that mean? Um, and as they knew they would, they found so many different things. It's an organisation called The Loop, and they do lots of back-of-house club testing. So they do drugs that have been confiscated or put in amnesty bins so that they can then put out a warning if there's anything that's particularly strong or whatever. And, and they did. They found drugs. Somebody would think it was this, and it was something completely different. There were things that had, that had got all sorts of different things um, mixed in as cheap fillers. Um, so things that were, were ground up paracetamol is a classic. That won't do an awful lot of harm, um, unless you take masses and masses of it, but you probably wouldn't if it's mixed in with something else. But other things like boric acid, which can do you a lot of harm, bleach, all sorts of things that can just be white powder that can be mixed in with anything. And some things that were nothing, like the ecstasy tablets that were just solid concrete. Um, but between one in four and one in five people who'd had their drugs tested didn't, didn't then want to take them because once they knew what was in them, other people just took the risk anyway. But it's, it's just a really important thing to keep in mind with illegal drugs that you've got something that's been made very, very carelessly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, they, the loop said that it, that it did. And also, it also gave them access to, to give harm reduction advice to, to thousands of young people that would never have had that. So there were young people that were intending to use drugs, but hadn't, wouldn't otherwise have contact with a, with a treatment agency, because you wouldn't unless you've got problems. Um, so they, they have data, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but they have data which they say shows that it's better. And actually, the... Um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the organisation, but the Royal College of somebody or other, public health, something like that. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I've got a rubbish memory. But, but they came out last summer as well and said they, they said all festivals should have, and actually all clubs as well, should have drug testing. It's a bit like legal exactly. Yeah, it's just trying, but, but it is obviously it is controversial because it is it saying, you know, this is how you can take drugs safely because you, because you can't actually anyway, because there are all sorts of other risks. Um, but it was, was just trying to be, t trying to be realistic and keep people safe, really. One, yes. One of the most distressing things I think is that the guy was saying, why can we make it look like anything? I know, you yeah. Know, there, there was something on the South East Regional Television News report from Recently, um, stuff that certainly wasn't Xanax or Valium was being made to look like standard Xanax or Valium. Well, on my Xanax slide, I will show you exactly that, exactly that. And it is just anything, and it is really important to remember that it's it's just all about making money. That's all it's about. 
and it's this random. And also, just um, there's a sub, has that, people heard of uh, fentanyl, which is a substance, in, and we're talking about Kent. So fentanyl is an um, incredibly strong opiate, and that's something that's appearing more and more and more. Again, it's uh, big bad news in the States, and it's coming over here more. And in Kent, yes, because it's incredibly strong. Um, and because it's incredibly strong, it's a gift for dealers, really, because you can have a tiny, tiny bit and have the same effect. So it's a lot cheaper. You can get it on the dark net like you can anything. Um, but it's something that's getting increasingly laced with other things, and it can make something more addictive or have more of a hit. But of course, because it's incredibly strong, the margin of error is minuscule. And, and when you see on that, there was um, uh, the thing on the news recently um, where you can see the emergency services going in or um, any kind of... Uh, frontline health services, and they've got the full, uh, not body armor, but you know, there's full kind of pr protection and mask and everything on, because you don't even have to take it. You don't have to consume it. You can just touch it or breathe it in. If it's very strong, it can, it can kill you. And uh, in Kent, there's um, Robert Fraser in November 2016 was the first recorded UK death from fentanyl. And I know his mum now, um, through, through all of this stuff. Um, but, but what happened to Robert? He was 18, he, he smoked weed, he went to his dealer to get some weed with a mate, and, and his dealer said, look, um, try this, free sample, little bag of white powder. He said, it's kind of like cocaine, MDMA. Um, Robert didn't even take his, he'd, put it, he'd got it out on the side um, in his bedroom. His dad went in the next morning and, found him, and just found him, him dead in his bedroom. And he hadn't even taken it, but he'd just been near it. But it's just so strong. And actually his mum now is campaigning for what she's calling Robert's Law, which is where there's a death involving fentanyl for that to be an automatic manslaughter charge. But that's another whole thing. But there are things appearing all the time. And um, anyway, risks. This is over to you again. In terms of exposure, this is from the school's data again. So 11 to 15 year olds, what percentage do you think of 11 year olds have been offered illegal drugs? So this isn't cigarettes or alcohol, this is illegal drugs. So offers, 11 year olds and 15 year olds, and then what percentage of each do you think have tried them? So talk amongst yourselves for a minute and see what you think. Right, okay. Does anybody want to have a guess? 11 years old. How many? Sorry? 20% of 11 year olds have been offered illegal drugs. Up or down? Who thinks up? Higher, higher, higher. We've got an 11 year old there. You think it's higher? Oh, okay. Voice from the inside. <laughs> Thank you. Who thinks it's lower than 20%? You think it's lower. How old are you? Aha, okay. <laughs> I'm going to see which 11-year-old is right. What do you think? 15%. Okay, what about 15-year-olds? 60%. 90%. How old are you? 12, okay. So we've got between 90 and 60. Does anybody think less than 60? 55, did you say? What about percent? What percentage of 11 year olds do you think might have tried something? Okay, what do you reckon? What percentage of 15 year olds have been offered illegal drugs? 70%, 70, 80% have been offered something. 90, 92%. <laughs> That's really precise. <laughs> have tried. So, what percentage do you think might have tried something? By the time you're 15. Think across your... No, don't think about your year group, otherwise you'll expose your school. Um, 
50%. What you think? Is anyone thinking less than 50%? 15-year-olds. Okay. This is the answer. So you're all much more pessimistic. <laughs> so you'll be heartened to know it's not as bad as you thought. But nevertheless, that's an awful lot of little 11-year-olds who've been offered something. 16%. 6% have tried something. 15-year-olds, it's 55%. So you were spot on there. <laughs> um, have been offered something and 37% have tried something. But remember, this is national data. So although you're in the countryside a little bit here with your sheep in the churchyard and everything, you are very close to London. And in the big cities, those level, and particularly London, those levels will be much higher. Um, so 55% have been offered. So more than half of 15-year-olds have been offered something. And 37% have tried something. So that's more than a third have tried something by the time they're 15. That's, and if you think of that on a kind of a graph, by the time you get to sixth form in terms of offer and, and trying something, it's going to have gone up. So that's the number of times, the, the kind of percentage of, of people that have been in a situation where they've had to make a decision. Who they got them from, according to this research data survey, 49% got them from a friend. So that's kind of their environment. 26% from a dealer. So from a friend, that's something that's called social supply, and I'm going to go on to look at drugs and the law a little bit later. So 26% from a dealer, though. So that's, that's, that's one in four young people who've tried something have got a dealer's number on their phone. Where they got them from, according to the survey, well, 52% was out and about in the park and the street. 14% was in somebody else's house. And it's worth thinking that somebody else might be your house. I know that's a terrible thing to think, but, and it might not be that it's your kids, but it might be your kids' friends or something. But anyway. And 14% was in school. And I, I, we, as I say, we're working with all of these schools now, and I've never, ever, I have not yet come across a school that has not got a zero-tolerance policy for drugs on the premises. Schools have got different policies about what they do if, if they know that kids are taking drugs in terms of whether they kick them out or support them. Mostly they support them. Um, but none of them have, will, are okay with drugs being on the premises for all sorts of understandable reasons. But, and yet 14% got them at school. And what they... Well, that, that data is now 11 to 15-year-olds. So that's, so actually for 15-year-olds, that's kind of, but it's, it's proportions of stuff. And what they didn't ask, because this was 2016 data, and this is something that's really, really shot up, is about people getting it online and through social media. There was a Stacey Dooley program. Stacey Dooley's brilliant, does really good stuff as well. And it might still be, I think it is still on YouTube, actually. I'm not sure if it's still on iPlayer. But it's about the um, young people buying and selling drugs on social media, particularly WhatsApp and Snapchat. And um, worryingly, one of the fake deals that she set up was with a 16-year-old, and it was right outside Box Park in Croydon. Um, but the other boy, the, the other thing that got said, it was a 14-year-old, and he was in his school uniform, and he got these pills in a bag. And, and, and when she said who she was, he said, oh, no, 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 they're just mints. Look, I'll take one. I'll just prove to you. And she was like, no, 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 don't take them. But it, it's just, anyway, it's another source. It's, it, accessibility is changing all the time, um, and communication is changing all the time. But don't panic. That's my don't panic slide. Most don't say yes, um, still. So 37% of the 50-year-olds have tried something. 63% haven't. Um, and those that do most of them don't come to harm. And I, I realise that I stand here as every parent's worst nightmare, but I am a worst nightmare. It, mostly people don't come to the harm that Dan did. But there are all sorts of shades of harm and damage that drugs and alcohol can do that you need to avoid. And this is what young people need. It's just that information, understanding and awareness and life skills, confidence, knowing how to come at those choices and out the other side safely. Okay, which two substances do you think cause young people most problems? Yeah, alcohol, that was really unanimous. What about the other one? Cannabis, absolutely. So in terms of young people in treatment, the majority are there for alcohol or cannabis. Um, alcohol, a few interesting facts that I came across recently, actually, I'm going to a nice committee meeting, a nice as in 
National Institute for Clinical Excellence, but I'm sure it'd be nice as well. But um, about specifically about uh, alcohol education in schools, and I found this data when I was reading stuff up on it. So it's actually it's, it's quite out of date. It's about ten or more years out of date, and one of the reasons they're doing this is to update it. But nevertheless, I'm sure this hasn't changed an awful lot, and I thought it was really interesting. Alcohol is the least regulated and most heavily marketed drug. I'm pretty sure that's much the same now. Children and young people aged 11 to 15 who regularly smoke or drink are much more likely than non-smokers and non-drinkers to use other drugs. And it doesn't mean if they do smoke and drink regularly, they won't use other stuff, or that if they don't, that they won't experiment with things. But there is, there is that statistically that connection. And this was something that was... Uh, this is really out-of-date data, I'm sorry. So I'm hoping to get some more recent data, but nevertheless, I'm sure it is still a significant factor. 8% of young people aged 15 to 16 reported having unprotected sex after drinking alcohol. And it was more girls than boys, which is, which is a worry. So it's probably the girls and, and slightly older boys. Um, you expose yourselves to all sorts of dodgy decisions if you've had alcohol and it stops you thinking clearly, impairs your judgment. All sorts of risks which you'll be aware of, more than aware of to young people with, with alcohol. But what do you think the most common risk is yeah absolutely it's having an accident so there's all the stuff about alcohol poisoning and, and and doing silly things and getting in a fight and all sorts of other stuff but it's having an accident because of the way it affects your coordination your balance and your judgment one in seven young people apparently have had an accident as a result of drinking so that could be little bumps and scrapes but also very big serious stuff as well and actually 22 percent of all accidental deaths in the uk are alcohol related so that's not young people that's any age but that's, that's a really high statistic. Just a little reminder, and I put this in actually because this was, I put this in a, a few months back because I was doing some staff training in a school and one of the teachers said, so how many units are there actually in a glass of wine? And it, it occurred to me that actually I wouldn't know all this stuff if I wasn't doing this. And it's, it's easy to forget as an adult how many units, but it's for young people particularly really important to understand what a unit looks like because especially when you're doing the social drinking and you've got a bottle of vodka going around and it's very easy to lose track but that's what a unit looks like. So a unit of, of, of any spirit, generally speaking, is about 25 mils, which is very, very little. Um, for wine, there's not a lot of wine that you get for your unit either. Same with beer and cider. And the important thing to remember for, for all of us, really, actually, but and for young people particularly, because that's our focus, it takes an hour for your liver to process every unit. The first hour doesn't count because it kind of takes that long to get there. Um, and you can't do anything to speed that up. So the more you put in, you just got to, it, it's going to take that long. Um, no amount of cold showers and big fry-ups and all that sort of thing will, will help. So keeping track of those units is really important. And, and this is, um, again, a question I ask in schools. How many, and your parents always know the answer to this, how many units a week do you think is the safe limit for under 15s? It's quite recent health advice. It is zero, yes, it is. Most young people don't say that, surprisingly enough, but it is actually, there is no, so that's the most recent guidance. Children under 15 just shouldn't drink alcohol. It is quite recent guidance, but there's a lot of evidence that, alcohol, because your, your brain is, we're going to go on to think about the brain, so many important changes that are happening. And alcohol is a drug. It does things to change your brain chemistry, but it also, your body isn't developed enough, your liver isn't developed enough to cope with processing the alcohol. There's also um, some, th there are two other pieces of research. One is shows that there's, there's a link between the, the, the younger you are when you have your first drink and the likelihood of developing problems when you're older. And of course, it doesn't mean if you have a drink when you're young that you will develop problems, but the, the, in evidence and research, there is that connection. There's also a, a, quite a recent piece of research which showed that people who had... Um, had a drink, uh, young people who had had alcohol at home, which, which for a lot of parents is a, for most, some parents don't, don't want their children to drink at all and abstinence is what they want. But for most parents, it's about becoming a responsible drinker and it's learning how to manage alcohol as, because most parents drink socially. So it's something that's round and about and it's legal and it's regulated and it's something that's available in supermarkets. Um, so for, for a lot of parents, it's Helping them to manage that at home is a really sensible thing to do. And you know you're on the continent, they have wine and water and meals from when they're really tiny. But this, this research that came out quite recently showed that if young people had had alcohol at home, they were much more likely to have alcohol outside home than if they hadn't. 
So young people that hadn't had alcohol in the home were more likely not to be at the parties, the ones that were taking the alcohol along or, or having it when they were there. No, for young... No, you can still drink alcohol. But as long as you... <laughs> remembering you're being a role model and all that sort of thing. <laughs> but don't give it to your under-15s, it's the thing. <laughs> um, what percentage, this is the data again, had been drunk in the... And I drunk is a bit loose phrase, but I know they have got a definition for it. It's something like being not in, feeling in control of what you're doing. What percentage of 15-year-olds have been drunk in the last month, do you think, given that they're not supposed to be drinking, really? Again, you'll probably think it's much worse than it really is. 30% is pretty close, 23%. So it's kind of one in four 15-year-olds in the last month reported that they had been drunk. And where did most young people get alcohol from? Yeah, it is. It, is, it could be nicking it or it could be being given it. And it's really, it's worth remembering, you can ask your 15-year-olds as well, it's different, different parents have different views on whether alcohol is or isn't okay. And so some parties will have alcohol, some won't, and you won't necessarily know. Because when you get, your kids are at secondary school, you don't tend to know. You might, maybe here you might more because it's a smaller community, so they might go from primary to secondary. But in most secondary schools, well, in the primary schools, you know, you chat in the playground and you go and pick them up when they go to play and all that sort of thing. So you know it's your friend, your kid's friend's parents. But by secondary school, you don't always. And so the message doesn't always get out there if it's going to be a party with alcohol that you might not want. And Julie feels very strongly about that particularly. And this is just what I put this in because I think it's just worth... Um, part of the conversation about alcohol is actually a lot of young people now, increasing numbers of young people, are choosing teetotalism. There is this thing about the millennial generation, but also the younger than millennials, um, who are kind of very health conscious, um, doing all sorts of other things that might be not so safe and risky, but, but, but particularly... And, and particularly in London, actually, the, the number of 20-somethings in London who are teetotal is higher than in, anywhere else. In terms of cannabis... A lot, of, a lot of young people think that cannabis is, is safe. A lot of young people know that it isn't. But there are really confusing messages for young people out around and about to do with cannabis, particularly because it's used, it can be used as medicine. And there's a lot of stuff in the used about medicinal cannabis. Um, because it's legal in some countries, and if something's legal, it must be safe. People don't die from it is another argument that young people will use. Well, it doesn't kill you, cannabis. It's not like MDMA or other stuff, heroin. It's just a plant, and that really is a thing. It grows in the ground, so how can it be bad for you, really? <laughs> um, it's only class B, and it's just weed. It's this thing about it's just weed. It's just, it's like, it's nothing. But, of course, it, it really isn't it's safe. It doesn't, it's... It really is a different thing altogether from what cannabis used to be 20, 30 years ago. The majority of... This, again, was very recent data. So the most recent crime data in terms of all the cannabis that was seized by the police in the last year, 94% of it is incredibly strong. The two chemicals that I was talking about in cannabis, THC and, and CBD, THC is the bit that has the psychoactive effect and makes those changes to your brain and can cause all sorts of um, mental health damage. That's really, really high levels. You're very unlikely to get the 6%, like old school cannabis that people used to maybe smoke, um, uh, um, going back years um, very very different more young people are in treatment for cannabis than for any other drug so this just weed is causing more problems than any other drugs put together the, the bit of your brain that cannabis affects is the bit that, that you need for concentration, learning and memory and even just a little bit affects that to a certain degree or to a significant degree for, for, for uh, and it kind of stays around for a couple of days, cannabis as well. It's also the, the strongest factor. There are lots of different factors in, in young people getting involved, seriously involved with illegal drugs. But the biggest factor is, is, is smoking cannabis in their teens. Um, and this, there is, as I've said already, this really strong connection with mental health problems, particularly psychosis um, and a certain number of those go on to develop schizophrenia, five times more likely 
to develop psychosis if you smoke weed. And unfortunately, is most people who smoke weed would probably not start in their mid twenties or thirties. They'll start. Most will start in their teens, when again their brain is going through all these important changes. And the changes that cannabis does are changes that don't get better. You know, some drugs, you, the, the harm they do, you can repair but the harm that cannabis does to young people's mental health. I, I don't know whether, if I was to ask for a show of hands here, does anybody know anybody who has a child who's been permanently harmed by cannabis? Yeah, I th any group of parents that I speak to, there will be at least one. And actually any group of older young people as well will have a friend who they know has just completely dipped out for whatever reason because of weed. Xanax, I said I'd talk about quickly. That is um, a, a rapper called Lil Peep who died not so long ago, just a few months ago, um, when he was 21. And he'd done, in fact, shortly before he died, he'd posted on Instagram a video of him putting Xanax in his mouth. And then, and then he died um, shortly afterwards. And he had sung a lot about Xanax and how amazing Xanax is and... Um, and also how very unhappy he was. And he was only 21, he was just so young. Um, but he, he died from Xanax. Xanax is something that is becoming an increasing concern um, for young people and people working with young for parents and people working with young people. It's, um, it's Xanax is a trade name, so there are lots of other names used for it as well, and it, but the, the drug itself is Alprazolam. It's used, it's a really strong anti-anxiety medication. So strong, in fact, that you can't get it on prescription um, on the NHS in the UK. It's quite widely used in America, and of course you can get anything online. But it, it has really, it's, it's much, much stronger than diazepam and Valium. And, and most of the stuff that is available in the UK is fake. So it will have been made in a pill press, like you were saying, Francis, and it's got goodness knows what in it. Um, lots of fake ingredients, particularly stuff coming over from China. There's a, there's a Vice 20-minute, um, they do got these, the, the, twin, the video that the ecstasy um, clip came from is a series they called High Society, but they've just done one on um, Xanax, that's on. I've got some, hopefully, I've got some um, handouts that I can give you at the end, they've got some of these slides on, and there's a link, yeah, Julie's thumbs up from Julie. Um, so I've put links to some of the videos and things that I've shown, I put that on there if, if you'd like to watch it, but it does show some of the reasons why people take it. In terms of risks, there's also, of course, um, potential legal, con illegal drugs are illegal, and giving any drugs, whether they're prescription medication. If, you, if anybody gets prescription medication from anybody that's not a doctor, that's an illegal source. Um, and there can be potential legal consequences. In terms of the, the, the legal penalties, it's possession and supply. Just a couple of interesting things to, to note. One is that this, um, again, I do love data, and I do this massive news draw every single day. I do this massive news draw for stuff and pick out anything that I think is relevant. So actually, if you do Facebook, follow us on Facebook, because I'm always putting things up that are, that are relevant, that I think are useful and interesting. But this came out recently. So from, from April 2016 to March 2017, 75% of all, all the recorded drug offences that there were were for cannabis possession. So again, in terms of it being just weed, being in possession of weed can get you a, a drug conviction. And in terms of supply, something I didn't realize, you might know, but I didn't, um, until all of this happened with Dan. But all you've got to do is give drugs to somebody else, and that is supply, and that's a criminal offense. So the boy that made the call that from this other school, he called his dealer, arranged a drop off, collected the money in, went and with a couple of mates and picked it up and shared it out. It wasn't until it came to the trial that the police arrested a couple of, of, of local lads for supply. There was a trial, there was a sentencing. And at the trial, the, the prosecution barrister said to us, that nice year 11 boy from a nice school in Croydon could have been charged with supply because he had supplied class A drugs. He wasn't because he was needed as a key witness in the trial, but that's the only reason. There's actually, there's a... Um, Again, this is something, there's a link on the handout that I'll give you. This is on uh, YouTube still, and it was um, a, a documentary that was made by BBC Three, and it's worth watching with your kids, actually, as well, especially older ones. But it's, um, it's just a, it's eight episodes, really, really short, five to six minutes long, and it tells the story. They were going to use Dan's story, actually, for it, but then they chose to use Christian Pay's story because 
that he's got the dimension that the lad that did exactly the same thing, a bunch of friends went to a festival, decided they wanted to take some pills. Simon was one of them, he was the older, he was 20, he went off and he collected the money and went off and found someone selling pills and bought them back, shared them out. And unfortunately, Christian Pay died. Um, Simon was then arrested and he ended up serving six months of a custodial sentence for supply. And he wasn't a drug dealer, but he was because he'd, he'd supplied drugs and that killed his friend. So that's worth a watch. And of course, all sorts of other things can go horribly wrong. The number of people that are in prison for getting involved in a fight because they've had too much to drink and something's gone wrong and they've end up, ended up killing somebody. Um, you can do embarrassing things. You can end up all sorts of other things in terms of legal things that can go wrong, underage sex. And of course, there can be really serious consequences in terms of employment, um, travel, Going to university, you have to put on a UCAS form if you've got any criminal convictions. I put this in for anybody that has um, a child who is in love with Ashley. I spoke to some year nine girls last week in a school. Apparently, lots of year nine girls are in love with Ashley from Raksu, um, which I had never heard of, but they won the X Factor last year. And Ashley was stopped from going to America last week because he was done for shoplifting when he was 13. They were going to go over and record their debut album and do some amazing production stuff. But he couldn't go because he'd got that criminal conviction. Sorry? Just for shoplifting. And in this country, that would have gone. But America, they find everything. They won't let you in for anything. So poor old Ashley. I don't think he even turned into a proper charge here, but it was on his record. Absolutely. Exactly. That's another sort of stupid thing that you might end up with. Not stupid. Well, it is stupid. But thing that you might not otherwise do if you've taken something that you're, that, yeah, and with a bunch of people that might not. Okay, on to the final stretch, and I've talked too long again. I'm really sorry, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to remember not to talk too fast, otherwise Julie will tell me off at the end. Um, but to get through my last slides, which are really important. So, on to why take drugs. Talk amongst yourselves for two minutes. What do you think is the motivation? Because understanding motivation for doing anything, but particularly risky things, is really important. Why do young people take drugs or have too much to drink? to him. It was in the email that I sent to him. Yeah, tell him to look at the email I sent him this afternoon because I sent it to him as a PDF and a Word document and I said to put it on the website. It's not there now. Oh, he hasn't put it on. He's to put it on, isn't he? Yes, I, I tell him to read his email. Right, okay. 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 What do you think some of the different reasons are? Peer pressure. Peer pressure. One of the things I do in a, in a workshop is I'll say, because it's really important to think about choices and understanding motivation and what your motivation might be, so you can be as much in control of those choices as possible. And I say, what, do, what are the top three reasons? I get to write it on their sheets. Peer pressure is on everybody's sheet, absolutely everybody's. What else do you think might be there, though, as well? Curiosity. Yeah. What's it like? Yeah. Absolutely. So it can be peer pressure, like people kind of go, do it, do it, do it, that sort of peer pressure. But it can be, well, everybody else is doing it, and maybe I won't be part of it. But also, everyone's doing it, and it looks like fun. Yeah. Stress, absolutely, and that's something that's an increasing worry, is the number of young people who are taking stuff to kind of, to self-medicate, really. What do you think? Yeah. To get the next bars. Yeah. Yeah. 
So doing it for the effect, but then moving on to the next thing, because actually that's boring now, and you're going to try something else. Yeah, thank you. This is from the, the um, school's data, but they didn't ask peer pressure. I don't know why they did it, but these are the reasons that came out. So in terms of first taking drugs, the majority is curiosity for across the ages. It's what would it be like? And it's like going back to that toddler thing of putting things in your mouth and kind of just to explore it, what's it like? Um, for the feeling of it, get, to get high, to feel good, because my friends were doing it, because it was just something that was around. Nothing better to do is a bit of a worry. Um, but forgetting problems is also a worry. So what you're saying about stress, that switching off, that coping with things. So 14 years, 24% of 14-year-olds first took drugs because they wanted to forget their problems, which is really, really worrying. Um, and in terms of most recently, so for some of those, that might also be the first time. Um, again, for the feeling especially for the older ones, 49%, 52%, wanted to see what it was like. Um, but again, down the bottom, 19% of 15-year-olds, um, the implication of that is, is um, taking drugs most recently is, is that it's more of a regular thing. Um, again, is to forget problems. So one in five taking drugs regularly to forget problems. Um, I'm, can, I, can I chat to you at the end, Olivia? To chat to Olivia at the end about different motivation for things, because I've just got some other things that I really want to go through, sorry. Um, and we've had some young people as well saying what they see the motivation is. Um, I know there was a really good talk that some of you might have been at last year on the, on, the, on the adolescent brain, but it's such an important thing to be aware of all those there are so many changes going on from 10 to 25, which is what they're saying adolescence is now. Um, there's this huge rewiring process going on and lots of changes that are taking place. And the very last bit to develop is the bit that you need for making decisions, really. It's that think ahead, that prefrontal cortex. So that's what you need for all those executive functions, so planning and organizing and thinking ahead. It's also the bit that helps us with impulse control and, and managing risk. And it's also kind of where our sense of self is, is lodged. So who we are and how we fit in and where we belong. Um, I'm going to show you just a really short bit of a, a video, um, which is somebody talking about the risks. I'm just wondering if I might actually skip it because I'm running a bit short of time. I've got the link on the thing. I'm going to skip it because I've put the link on the slides I'm giving you. So watch it at home. And I've also put a link to a really good TED talk, which is longer. This is about three minutes long, um, which just explains some more about the teenage brain. And I've, I've, there's a book as well that I'm going to talk about at the end, which is really worth, if you like books, it's really worth looking at. But it's really important um, for young people to be aware of how complex those dynamics can be when they're making decisions, because the more aware of it, the more in control of it you can be. One of the things that's so hard for us about um, what happened to Dan, one of the many things that was so hard, but one of the, the things that was hardest was that it was a choice. You know, it was something that Dan could have chosen to do differently and then he'd still be here. Um, and of course, I understand, you know, I do know, I understand curiosity and I understand that, that how difficult things can be when people around you are doing stuff. When Dan died, people talked about peer pressure. And, what we, and I, I thought about something like Mean Girls, you know, where you've got the confident kids and the, the, the new kid who's got, trying to work out how she fits in and you've got to wear pink on a Wednesday, otherwise we can't sit on our table and all this. And that just didn't make sense for, for Dan. He was a big character, Dan. He was confident, he was popular. Um, and, and he was more than capable of, of holding his own and saying no to stuff. But of course, it can be a lot more like the frog in the boiling water. You know, that thing about if you put a frog in a pan of boiling water, it'll just jump straight out. But if you put a frog in a pan of cold water and bring it to, to boil, um, it doesn't realize and it ends up boiled frog. And it can be so like that with friendship groups. Um, don't try it at home, any small boys in the audience, because it's not true, it doesn't work. It's very mean to frogs. It's a parable, I think. Um, but, but with Dan, um, we found out, I mean, again, it's a long story, I won't go into it because I'm running short of time, but, but when we got his phone back from the police after the sentencing of the supplier and actually some of his other friends decided that we really needed to know what really happened, it turned out that a very good friend of his um, had played a very active role in getting Dan involved in, in taking stuff, but by very, very little things, sort of starting out with, so amazing, Dan, you've got to try, we've taken them, particularly MDMA and cocaine is what she was on about. So amazing, Dan, you've got to try, so amazing, Dan, you've got to try. And he's to start off with saying stuff like, look, just be careful, I don't want you to end up on Jeremy Kyle. 
but she we thought this was the first time he'd taken anything actually it was the third time first time she gave him a little taster at a gig they'd been at together and then she got him and another friend some of their own from her supplier at, a, at, a, at a, another gig I didn't know people took drugs at gigs I'd have had very different conversations before he went if I'd known and that for him and for her had not been a good experience he hadn't wanted to go to this rave as I said he hadn't been particularly keen to take this stuff again um, but that whole kind of it's so amazing you've got to try it Little, little steps. Friendship group formed. New boy joined the school for sixth form. A little group formed, who, which Dan, who Dan was friends with, but Dan was friends with everyone. He could have sat on any table in the Mean Girls analogy. Um, but he was also part of this group for whom drug taking was normal. It can happen, to the best of us. But it's really important to be aware that there are all those factors at work. Um, this is a book that, I'll, um, again, is, is on the handout that I'll give you in terms of a link, but it's only recently been published. Sarah Jane Blakemore, and she does the TED Talk that I recommend as well. Really, really interesting. Adolescent brain development, if you're interested in these things. But, um, one of the other factors when you're an adolescent is you are much more likely to take risks. Lots and lots of studies have been done to, sh to show that you are much more likely to take risks if you are with your friends. Um, and if your emotions are running high, hot context. And the other thing to take into consideration in terms of risks in young people, uh, that, that young people take into consideration, and actually as adults we do as well, is that social risk. So the example she gives actually is specifically about a 15-year-old, an ecstasy, and who weighs up. They know, that they know that it's risky, but their friend's offering it to them, and, and there's this social risk of being left out. Would I not, what, you know, what, what if I'm not part of this friendship group anymore? And in weighing up the social risk against the risk of the drug, in the scenario, the 15-year-old decided to risk the drug rather than risk the, the loss of a friendship group. In terms of types of drug use, obviously there are... There are um, it's, it's, not on a, on a, it's not on a path, but for most young people, it will be experimental. It'd be trying something out, it'd be a dabble, and, and most of the time it might be a dip in and a dip out. For some, that might then become more of a recreational thing, like you were talking about at the back there, that it becomes more regular, it's every week, it's every weekend, it's maybe different stuff, but maybe not problematic at that stage. Um, Dependence is when it has become problematic for either physically or psychologically you, you can't manage now without this substance. In terms of how you can tell if your child is using drugs, the most, the most surefire way is that they might tell you. Somebody else might tell you but then you need to know what to do with that information. You might see effects or after effects. Um, and I'll go through what some of those might be. And you might find stuff around the house or in a pocket when you're doing the laundry or in a bedroom. Paraphernalia or stuff themselves. There's some bits of paraphernalia. There's some cannabis-related stuff. Shiny surfaces, needles and uh, straws and things. Little bags with debris of white powder in. All of these are apparently signs of, of drug use. All of these things here. They are also signs of perfectly normal teenage behaviour. <laughs> so if you have a child that's just suddenly got a bit moody and doesn't want to talk to you anymore and is a bit smelly under the armpits, it doesn't mean that they're, they're taking anything. But as part of a bigger picture with some of these other things as well, unexpected changes to weight or build. Steroids are a weight loss or a weight or muscle building thing, but other drugs as well, appetite loss or appetite gain. Unusual, funny smells, things that you're not sure about, new stuff. Unpredictable behaviour, self-harm, all sorts of reasons that there can be for that, but it would be a concern. Hanging around people that are using drugs. Access to stuff is a really big factor in anyone taking anything. Too much or too little money. New stuff that they've got that you don't know where they've got it from, maybe. Or nicking stuff from around the house. Suddenly doing less well at school. Again, can be different reasons. Talking about drugs on social media, maybe having stuff around the house. In terms of the harm reduction message and what I was saying about the drug testing, it's a really difficult message for parents um, particularly, but it's so important because anybody can get caught up in something. Anybody can in that moment go, or oh, go on then. And what you want is just that your children, if they do get in that moment, know enough to reduce the harms. But actually it's also really useful for them in terms of their friends because they might be with friends that are taking something. So some, some, some practical things, 
think ahead. Make sure that phone's cho cho chopped up. Don't end up somewhere where you can't make a call. If you need to get a battery pack, make sure that's packed up, charged up. Make sure you've got that with you. How are you going to get home? Stick together. This is the advice we give to young people. So you're looking out for each other, but make sure your choices are your own choices. What's your drink? Spiking. We've got spikies that you can take away there. There was a um, drink spiking story from um, Catherine that you can hear afterwards. But it happens a lot. Uh, but also watch those units. Don't mix anything. Alcohol and anything is a really bad idea. There's... Um, all sorts of substances interact in very different ways. And of course, if you've had a few drinks, it's the easiest thing in the world to make other bad decisions. If anybody is taking anything, they've got to remember, if it's an illegal drug, they're basically testing it on themselves. They don't know how strong it is. They don't know what else it is. So don't jump in with a whole pill. Don't jump in with a whole bag of something because you just don't know what it is. Safest way is to steer clear. But if anybody finds themselves saying yes to something, just think, just think through that. Variable factors that affect risk, the substance itself, but also the individual. All sorts of variables to do with the individual, the mood you're in, if you're a bit under the weather, um, what your expectations are, the environment that you're in, thinking things through and other things you might regret. And if anybody doesn't feel safe, just to get somewhere safe really quickly. We've given you all a, a, a card that's got 10 top tips on. So I won't go through that, but do have a look at that at home. And do take more as well for friends or anybody at home. But just a couple of practical things. One is, you, you, you probably know this already, but if you, if you don't and if your kids haven't got it already, you can put the, um, your emergency contact details, they can put them on their phone so they can still be accessed if the screen locks on. And that way... You get a phone call if anything goes wrong for any reason straight away and you don't have to wait an hour and have the police knocking at your door like, like we did. But you can do that, any phone now. It used to be just iPhones and now you can do it on any phone. Just Google it. In terms of conversations, there's a book again that I'm going to recommend that's really, really good. I've, I've meant to have them with me to show you, but they're in my bag. Um, but this is the kind of top things. So I'll look at holding it up there and I've got a slide on it later and a link to it on my, on my, my handout. Make sure you've got, get information. There's stuff out there that you can know, but also don't feel you've got to be any kind of specialist or expert before you can have a conversation. Um, take, there's always opportunities for conversations on, oh, there's a Holby City story coming up, I think, tonight on, on hepatitis C from injecting. Was it last night? Okay. <laughs> I read about it today. There was a recent storyline about uh, medicinal cannabis on Coronation Street, I think, with alcoholism on EastEnders. But there's always stuff in the news and on television. And, and it's trying to keep that conversation open as well and listening as much as talking and, and making sure you're somebody that they can go back to. And for the young people here, talk to your parents because actually, do you know, they care about you more than anybody else in the entire universe. And the world is very different for you than it was for them, and they don't know unless you tell them. Be honest um, about reasons for, about your reasons, you, it, wh why you're wanting, why it's so important. And you might want to think through, there might be some awkward questions that, that you might anticipate getting, and think through how you might respond to those. And if it all goes horribly wrong, don't give up and think that's it. Just be honest about that as well and have another go because it's so important. Um, and of course, that was another moment for the youth ambassadors. Okay, Olivia, um, talk at the end to Olivia, because again, I'm really conscious of the time. But Olivia will give you some really top tips about how to, to kind of good moments, and also talk to the other kids. So you've got three 15-year-olds there who I'm sure will be more than happy to talk to any parents. What is a good way to have those conversations? What would be awful? When is the worst time to pick to have a conversation uh, with your kids? This is something else that we came up with. Um, again, I came up with after Dan died when we knew he hadn't really wanted to go to this rave. He hadn't really wanted to take this stuff. What if we just had some kind of secret sign, a, an escape plan? And then I came across this thing. It's, he's a pastor in the States, Bert Fultz, and he had came up with this for his kids, and it's, it's much better, much more sophisticated than my idea. Um, and he calls it the X plan because on the basis that Everybody has been in a situation, all of us probably in this room, have been in a situation where we've ended up doing something we didn't really want to do because we weren't quite sure how to get out of it without losing face. Not necessarily drugs and alcohol stuff, but all sorts of things. So this is what he came up with his kids. He calls it the X plan because they text him an X. If they're just somewhere and you think, do you know, I really don't feel comfortable, I don't want to be here anymore, but I can't say that, they'll text him an X. You've agreed, but you have to have a conversation about it. Agree a simple message. 
that, so that's the X. And what will you'll say, so what he does, he doesn't really say anything, so that they can just say something really vague. Like, that was my dad. I don't know what's happened. Something's kicked off. I've just got to get home now. And then they haven't got to come up with some convoluted story. Your plan, hopefully, you'll know how they're going to get. They might have ended up somewhere they didn't mean to be, and then your plan might have gone a bit wrong. But there'll be some plan somewhere, and you can work that out. What you have to do as a parent, which is really, really hard, but, but which is what makes it work, is that you have to promise you're not going to ask them any questions about it, however hard that might be, because they will think twice and three times about triggering it if they know they're going to get a massive hard time from their mum or dad. And you know you've done a good job in giving them a radar about what is and isn't a safe place to be. And what you want more than anything is to make sure that they're safe. Um, but it is really, that's the really hard bit. And you might not be comfortable doing that. And if you're not, then that's fine. You can still have a go at it anyway. These are all places you can go. We've got cards you can take away. Frank is the government site for young people on drugs. Rise Above has got all sorts of different stuff for 11 to 16-year-olds, mental health, online safety, bullying relationships. Um, for um, Again, that's Public Health England. Drink Aware for Alcohol. Um, Rise, uh, uh, NHS Go is a health app. The other two... Drugsun.me and the Loop and Vice, they're both harm reduction sites. So if you've got older teens particularly, it's really worth looking at those. They, they're on individual substances. Drugsun.me is text-based. The Loop and Vice are videos, um, and they're just a couple of minutes long. And one of them is specifically about interaction. So having this with this, this is what the effects might be and what the risks. You can really reduce harm is not to take anything at all. But if you do take that risk, then this is what is good to be aware of. These are the books I was talking about. I've got a copy of the Teenage Brain one you can look at as well, and they're on the slide. So if you're interested in, and you're a person that likes reading stuff, they are both really valuable reads. Dr. M. Baden-Jones is the man for young people and drugs. He's, he's now chair of uh, the Advisory Council for the Misuse of Drugs. He recently opened the, the first ever uh, clinic for young people with, who are addicted to prescription drugs. He's, he's really, really good. He's also a dad. And he wrote this book for parents as a parent. Lots and lots of scenarios and case studies and, and examples of things. These are places you can go. And again, these are on the slides. If you need more help and support, DrugFam particularly, they've got a helpline. And DrugFam is a charity that exists for fam to support families of people that have got concerns about um, family members who are, um, have got problems with drugs or alcohol. And that's all our social media. And I said, as I, I'm really good at Facebook. I'm not very good at anything else, but I'm, I've got really good at Facebook since Stand I, but only for foundation stuff. But I'm always posting stuff on there. That's kind of our live news feed for parents and young people and teachers and professionals about stuff that's out there and current. And, and that's the, the end of my presentation. But I just, what, in terms of what, what's next, do take away resources. We've got all sorts of stuff there that you can take away with you. Um, We've given everyone a feedback form. We'd really appreciate your feedback. And if you don't have to rush away, if you would like to stay in contact with us or us to stay in contact with you, if you put your contact details at the bottom, then um, we can make sure you get a newsletter and things. Um, Calliope here, as I, as I said at the beginning, is doing some research, and she's, she would love anyone that doesn't have to rush away if they've got a couple of minutes, two minutes, two, three minutes, um, just to chat to Calliope, and she'll just record an interview, if that's okay, just to get your feedback, your verbal feedback from this evening. And then we're hoping that people might not mind her contacting them in, a, in a, maybe a couple of months and find out what impact it's had. And do stay in touch through Facebook and stuff. And, and uh, as, as um, Francis has said, I know there's going to be a leaving collection, so thank you very much for, uh, in anticipation of your generous donations at the end of the evening. But if there are other ways that you'd like to get involved and support us as well, we're always open to offers of volunteering support. Anybody that works for, for a company that does um, charitable giving in some way or other, if you want to do a, a sponsored thing, the majority of the work we do, we do for free because the majority of the schools we work with are state schools who have no money. We're a small and rapidly growing charity. So obviously we can only do what we do because of the funding of the people that, that support us. So anything you can do to help would be really, really welcome. There is a donation form in your, in your newsletter as well. I apologise for overrunning by five minutes. I'm really sorry. I did warn you I'd talk too much. Sorry. Um, we will be around now if anybody has got any questions. And do talk to Olivia as well. And do chat to Julie. Do take a handout. Um, and, and do take care. Thank you.
Well, Fiona, thank you so much. I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everybody when I say thank you for giving up an evening to tell us things we really do need to know. Very, very grateful to you. And I do apologise for our problems with the PA system. It's, it happens. <laughs> I think it was my fault, actually. <laughs> no, no, I won't hear that. But we ha do have a small something for oh, you. thank you. <laughs> and um, we are very, very grateful to you. Well, I'm um, very happy. Um. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, thank Still, thank you. you. So, thank you.